one of their shirts tonight at the meeting, but now I can put my smock on. Um, like I said before, I, I was down in uh, California last week. Um, I did a three-day class, and people, people tonight I heard walking in, they're going, oh, God, I could never do that and all that kind of stuff. You know what? The people I had in San Diego, none of them had ever done basket illusion before. And by the end of the class, each of them had turned at least one small ball. We did tool handle, and we, we did another little thing too. So, you know what? Can't be that hard or else I wouldn't be able to do it. So, um, my name is Doug Schneider. Uh, most of you know that. A lot of you know that. I've been around this club uh, for a long time. Um, and it's still a darn good club, and I'm glad to see that we have a lot of the old members still here, but we also have fresh faces coming and all that kind of stuff, which is always good. Uh, Lee Carter over there is certainly uh, one of the biggest influences in wood turning in northern Colorado or Colorado, and I'm glad he uh, saw fit to come tonight. Uh, he certainly got me started on the path as well as many others. Um, I do, uh, I used to teach, I was in public education for about 28 years. Um, I retired after 2014 school year. Um, I got hired on at Woodcraft here. I do work out in the store, but I also um, teach the classes. My wood turning classes, uh, I teach typically two or three a month um, and have fun doing that. Um, last week I was in California. Uh, the first week of May, I'm going to be down in Albuquerque working with that group. Uh, for those of you who want to learn to do basket illusion, I am doing a five-day class at Craft Supplies starting on the 15th of July. Uh, come and we'll spend a whole week doing basket illusion. Everything from dishes to platters to hollow forms to whatever. So the opportunities are there. Um, and it's good to be here too, by the way. Okay, we're going to start with, oh, first thing we're going to do is, we'll pass these around, I guess. Um, this is a handout I have, 25 quick and easy steps to basket illusion. Okay? Just like that. And it's done. Okay? Pass those around. If you want one, take one. If you don't want one, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Okay? Um, I, I taught high school kids for 28 years. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I did check, make sure this lathe has power to it. Uh, two years ago, I did, the, did a demo here. It was January of 2017. I did a demo on basket illusion. Okay? People going, oh man, a rerun. Well, sort of, except we're using different tools tonight. Two years ago, I used the Sorby beating tools and those alone. Now I have switched and I use the D-Way tools primarily. And so tonight's demo is just going to be on using the D-Way tools. Uh, the first demo I did is actually uh, January, I think it was the, I forget what day exactly, but Camille called me. I was working here at Woodcraft, and I, at, I was actually still president at the time, and she called me and she goes, um, it's snowing down here in, in our area. Are we going to have a meeting tonight? And I go, well, I said, I know the president is planning on being here, and so is the demonstrator, so... I think we're going to have a meeting. We'll just see how many people show up. Uh, it, it was a small attendance due to the weather. Um, Hoyle uh, put the video. He goes, comes up to me after the meet or after the demo, and said, "Hey, can we maybe put this on on YouTube uh, so that those who weren't here can can see what you did and all that?" And um, keep in mind, I didn't get a smartphone until like eight months ago because. You know, stupid people should not have smartphones. But um, so I, I go, whatever. I don't know what YouTube is, but go ahead and do it. I checked the other day. Uh, we're a little bit north of 186,000 views on my video uh, from two years ago. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to video this one as well, put it on YouTube. It's going to be Doug Schneider Basket Illusion 2.0 using the D-Way tools. So it'll be a, a second approach to the same uh, procedure. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to go from here to here. 
Uh, and we're going to be kind of using the cooking show method of uh, bringing up some pieces that are, you know, in various stages and working on them. We'll just pass this around. This is just a, you know, simple little thing. Actually, we'll pass this one around too. This is the bowl that I turned um, in San Diego, um, so we'll pass that around as well. Okay. Uh, tonight we're using cherry. My favorite woods are cherry. I, I love turned cherry. It smells good when you're turning it. It cuts good and all that, and it looks good when you're done. I also do quite a few of my pieces out of maple. I think that one I know is maple. Uh, maple, it turns a little better maybe. It's a little colder color. Uh, the colors pop out more, but the wood itself is a little colder than cherry. Cherry is a little warmer, so I do like using the cherry. You can do beadwork with other woods as well. Uh, down in San Diego, we used uh, some poplar. Uh, we used some maple, uh, and the poplar actually turned pretty well. I've done alder before. I had one of my friends who runs the um, visitor center here in Loveland. Uh, he came up to me a couple years ago after he had seen my stuff at, at Sculpture in the Park and said, yeah, could, could you do some of those little bowls for the for the visitor center? I go, well, maybe. He goes, okay, there's only two things, though. Number one, they have to be less than $100, and number two, they have to be made out of Aspen, because that's what people want when they come to Loveland, is they want to buy Aspen. So this one is out of Aspen, and I just beaded the outside of it and left the inside clear so that they could see that it's Aspen. Um, I don't do these anymore. Um, it's a little more of a challenge, but it does work. Okay, I was checking to make sure my lathe works. Uh, luckily, it wasn't plugged in, but now it does work. Uh, last year, I was doing a demo down in Pueblo for the Pueblo Club, and um, I was getting all my stuff ready and all set up, and the president of the club comes up to me, Lois, and she goes, okay, we have one small problem for your demo tonight. And I go, okay, what's that? We don't have any power to the lathe. You're going to have to do your demo without a lathe <laughs> or without power. And I go, okay, this is going to be interesting. So I would show what I'm going to do and all that, and I'd put the wood on, and I'd hold my tool and all, all that and say, okay, now once we get that done and get all that beaded, and I would have the different steps. I said, okay, we're doing this. Now we're going to do this and all that. Well, at the end of the night, we got through it all right. And at the end of the night, about half of the people in the crowd came up to me and said, you know, that was one of the best demos we've ever had because you actually told us what you were doing. Most, most of the time, the turners just get so involved in the turning that they, uh, that they don't really tell us what's going on. Okay, the ironic part is they just moved to a new facility, hence the reason they had problems plugging in the lathe. The ironic part is where they moved to into was the local IBEW meeting hall, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and no one until that night figured out that a four-pronged plug will not fit in a three-hole outlet. <laughs> Even I know that one. Okay, um, we're going to start off turning this. We could be using a chuck and a, and a screw center. Uh, which I did use for a year or two. Uh, right now, though, what I use is this outfit here. Okay, this is out of Craft Supplies. It's a, um, it screws on the lathe that has the screw here. It has various face plates that go on here depending on the diameter of wood you're playing with. Okay, if I'm doing one of my 20 inch platters, I'm going to use the big, the big plate. If I'm doing something a little smaller, I'm going to use that one. If I'm doing something a little smaller, I'm going to use that one, and smaller yet, use that one. And these all just, and it's a very tight fit, it's all machined and all that, but you can get that at craft supplies. Okay, we're going to put this on. Okay, good enough. Now, some there are some people who doubt the holding strength of this little screw on a piece of wood, I would challenge them any day. I've turned 20 inch platters uh, with a half inch of screw thread into the platter and I've never had one come off. Uh, they're good, they're on there well, so long as you drill the right size hole. Typically I use a 5 16 hole depending on the wood, 
Okay? Now, normally, I will admit at home, I would turn my lathe on slowly, about 200 RPM, and let the lathe screw the piece of wood on. You have to know when to let go. Okay? Once it gets on there tight, it's going to spin, and if you don't let go, it will put creases in your hand or whatever. So, but tonight, for safety purposes, we're going to screw it on the right way. Okay? Good enough. Okay. I'm using this tool rest. Um, I do not like the cast iron tool rest that comes with this lathe because cast iron tool rests tend to get nicks and chips and all that kind of stuff and it's hard to slide tools across them smoothly. Um, the next step up is getting robust which are sitting here somewhere. Um, I like this one a little better. Uh, this one has a 3 8 diameter steel rod on it as opposed to a 1 8 so it lasts a little longer. I also like the profile of it being so vertical I can really drop my tools down and get shear cuts with them. This is one made by Steve Sinner, um, also Advanced Lathe Tools, LLC. Um, I do drop names once in a while and tell people, tell my students about tools that I do like. Um, only if I like the tool and use it, and only if I like the person selling it. And Steve, I like him. He's a good old Iowa boy. Um, I haven't seen him for a couple years now because his wife's been having some health issues, but he's a good guy. Uh, I, told, I told one of my classes one time here that um, I really like these tool rests, and so I was calling Steve about a week or so later to get a new tool rest, get a bigger one um, to go to Utah with uh, for the Utah Symposium. And he goes, oh, yeah, you're going to be at the Utah Symposium. I go, yeah, I'll tell people that I use your tool rests. I always do and all that kind of stuff. He goes, oh, that's where that came from. I go, what's that? He goes, well, I had a guy call me the other day, and he said he had taken a class out in Colorado, and uh, the instructor really recommended my tool rest, so he goes, he ended up ordering a 4-inch, a 6-inch, a 9-inch, a 12-inch, a 14-inch, a 16-inch, an 18-inch, and a 22-inch. <laughs> so he goes, your tool rest will be in the mail tomorrow, and there won't be any charge on this one. So it's like, cool. I like it. Okay, first thing we're going to do is make this thing round. Um, I do have a tendency, I, I'm ambidextrous, I turn right-handed and left-handed. I'm going to turn primarily right-handed on this so that the camera shows it better and all that kind of stuff. Whenever you do start a piece of wood on the lathe, always stand off to the side in case something flies off of it and all that kind of stuff. Um, turn it over by hand, make sure it's not hitting the tool rest. Uh, we kind of have an old saying among wood turners that if when you turn it on it hits a tool rest, you kind of got two choices. You either need to move the tool rest back or you need to sharpen it. I don't want to take time to sharpen it, so we're going to just move it back. Okay, that's good enough. And, say what? Yeah, they are. Too much steel to remove. I'm rubbing my bevel and I'm cutting across face grain. I do not ever want to go straight into end grain. Okay? And we've got a little bit of tear out here. I'm not concerned about that at the at current time because we're going to remove all that wood anyway. If I was concerned about it, there'd be two things I would do. Number one, I would increase the speed of my lathe a little, and I would decrease the speed of my tool. And because I am putting a little bit of a taper on this, I would cut it left hand and go from bottom to top. But just by doing that, we pretty well got rid of all of that tear out. I can ask these guys in the front row if they can see any, because I know they're all old and they don't have that good of eyesight anymore anyway. But, <laughs> so they're going, oh, it looks good from here. Okay, cool. 
Um, okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make our mounting method. And what I typically do is I use um, a, a recess in, in these platters. Because that way, when I get done turning, I can round it off a little bit and uh, get rid of it, and I get to keep the full thickness of the wood. If I'm doing a, a tenon, I'm going to lose a quarter inch or whatever of the wood. So this way I can use, I still have the full thickness of the wood, I'm going to get rid of it later anyway. Okay? I was asked by somebody, it's like, do you actually use those tools that are in that case? And it's like, yeah, I use them every day. Um, yeah. I, I just haul them around, but um, I do use them. This, this tool here, uh, Carter will like this one. He'll probably try and take it away from me. This is actually one of Doc Thode's old uh, Ashley Isles parting tools. Uh, Doc Thode is an old member of the club. Um, unfortunately, we lost him, what, 10 years ago probably? Um, an old retired doctor, heck of a guy, heck of a sense of humor. Um, some, rub some people the wrong way, but I always got along well with them because I had kind of the same sense of humor. This is one of his parting tools. I don't lend it out very often. I had one guy in my class, he's been in several classes, and I looked over one day in the classroom and there's just a cloud of smoke coming up off his leg that's like, what are you doing, Jeff? And he goes, well, that, that parting tool of yours just doesn't work very well. Well, he had his lathe turned up to about 3,500 RPM in reverse with the, tool, with the parting tool upside down. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work that way. Okay. Um, here's the center of my thing right there. And I know from experience that I'm going to need a little bit more than a two-inch recess in here. I like using recesses more than tenons, like I said, because that way I get to keep the, the full thickness of the wood. And when I was growing up, recess was always kind of my favorite part of the school day. So that's why I like it. Now, don't use your calipers and set it at two and a quarter and put it up against the wood. If you get that on the uphill side, that is going to come back, fly back, stab you in the heart, you know, put your eye out, whatever, okay? Um, what I prefer doing, and I did not, yeah, I do. What I prefer doing is using a ruler, okay? I typically use a little six-inch ruler. I'm going to set it here, away from the wood. Here's about an inch and an eighth. I know that's going to work, okay? Is that two and a quarter? Pretty darn close, okay? Don't use your calipers on spinning wood. Not real safe. Okay, so now all we're going to do is we're going to put our recess in. Now, we're going to put the chuck inside of there. The chuck does have flared-out jaws, okay? I did not know until a year or two ago out at Allen's when we had Glenn Lucas. Glenn told me that the jaws on a Vicmark chuck are at 77 degrees. I always thought they were 78, but he said 77. So now I make sure that I hold my parting tool at 13 degrees off of perpendicular so that I can get that 77 degree recess in there, okay? Now, we need to take that wood out of the middle. It really doesn't matter how. If you want to use a round nose scraper, if you want to use a skew, if you want to use whatever tool you have, we're just getting rid of wood. Close enough for now. Now we'll grab another tool. Do not report this to AAW uh, or to Alan Lacer that I am using a skew as a scraping tool, but for making that recess and for making sure that that corner is very sharp, the skew works as good as any, okay? That corner back here has to be sharp. It has to be at an angle, okay? It can't be rounded over. Your chuck's not going to sit in there solid. It can't be straight up and down. If all you have are the... Um, carbide tip tools like the Easy Woods or whatever, uh, you will have to use your little pointy tool uh, to clean up that corner because a square tool won't get it, okay? 
and that looks probably good enough, okay? It's probably five thirty seconds of an inch deep or something like that, okay? Now all we're going to do is just get rid of wood. I'm not that concerned about the turning. By the way, too, anytime you have questions during this thing, please let me know. Uh, raise your hand if you need to throw something at me, throw it softly. Um, I'm old. Okay, one thing I do like to do about this time is I'm going to put a, I'm going to put a little no-go line there, okay? I don't want to cut past that line. If you make too thin of a collar, like take it all the way back to here, as you tighten up the chuck in there, you have a good chance of that ring popping off. If you leave yourself, you know, five-eighths, three-quarter, whatever, you're going to have a pretty solid um, place there, pretty solid grab for the chuck. I am cutting from small to big. That way I'm cutting across the grain like so as opposed to digging into it. It's giving me a smoother surface. Right now, we probably don't have that smooth a surface because I was just pretty well trying to hog wood out. What I'm going to do now is do a little uh, shear cut and start to refine this a little bit. When you are trying to refine your shape, don't look down here at the tool. You can't see it anyway. It's covered up with wood shavings. Look up here on the top horizon. That's where you're going to see what you need to see. Okay. Now, if I were to get one more tool for my turning collection, the one tool I'm thinking about getting yet is the, the big two-inch wide shear scraper deal. I need one of those, but for doing the outsides of hollow forms and bowls. But you know what? Gouge works pretty good so long as you have this cutting edge at around 45 to 60 degrees. By doing that, if you have your handle about 45 degrees, you're going to end up with that. So it works pretty darn good. Take a look at this. Looks pretty darn good. Um, really no tear out, anything like that. So we're going to start beating. Uh, what we're going to do first, I'm going to get rid of this corner. I generally start my beating up here on the top rim. I want to make sure that that rim is flat. I want to make sure that that corner is round. Okay? Now, typically when I'm doing a piece like this, I will generally, I, I like using the eighth inch beating tool. I have several. I have the 3 16th, the eighth, the 3 32nds, and then I realized that wasn't small enough, so I had to get the 16th inch yet. Um, I did use each tool to turn the handle that is on it because when I'm using these at home, I have a, a rack here with holes in it vertical, and I can tell by looking at this that that's my 3 32nd tool. Uh, this one's 3 16th. I know looking at the beads and looking at the color pattern what tool it is I'm grabbing out. Uh, these handles do come off. Uh, the first time I saw a person demonstrate beading, uh, he was using these tools unhandled, and someone said, shouldn't they have handles on them? He goes, oh, I just don't see any reason why to put handles on them. I personally don't see any reason why not. I mean, number one, they look cooler. Number two, they work better. You do have a little more, you know, hand grip with them and all that kind of stuff. So we'll pass one of these around and take a look at it. Just try not to drop it on the concrete floor. Question. Yes. Yes. It, it is. I'll pass it around. Um, actually, I'll, I'll pass around the one that's still, still dirty. Um, it is a bowl gouge. I use a swept back grind. I used to use the David Ellsworth grind. Now I've kind of converted to the Glenn Lucas grind. And so now, yeah, I'm kind of in between the two. It, yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I like the swept back grind on the gouge. That way I can use it as a shearing tool. Um, I know there's others, you know, the 
Stuart Batty has his 40-40 and all that kind of stuff, and his gouges work good for him. Uh, these work good for me. I was fortunate enough, fortunate enough when I first started turning um, back in the early 90s, I was able to take a workshop with David Ellsworth in his studio in Pennsylvania, and that's what we used. And so that's what I've been using now for 25 years. Um, and I like it because um, it's versatile. I can, do, I can do everything with that uh, that anybody can with any other gouge, and it's safe. It, it doesn't have any sharp corners that catch or roll or whatever, so I like it. It's a good grind. Um, that one's actually a reversible gouge. On the other end is uh, a bottom feeder or a bottom cleaning gouge. Uh, again, a Glenn Lucas. That is a Glenn Lucas design. So, okay. Um, we're going to start with my 3 16 I, I put a little bigger rim on these using the 3 16 tool for two reasons. Number one, that helps define the thickness of my bowl. It's going to be three-eighths of an inch thick, basically. And also, when you look at baskets, most baskets have a little bigger rim on them than they do uh, the weavings for the body of the bowl. So uh, that's what I'm going to do here. Okay. These tools are, are a D-Way tool. They're made by a guy by the name of Dave Schweitzer out of Washington. They're a shearing tool. With these tools, I'm going to use them three different ways. I typically cut my beads in three passes. The first pass, I'm going to have my tool down like this. I think you can see it on the monitor. My second pass, I'm going to raise the handle up a bit. And my third pass, I'm going to ha have the handle almost horizontal. Okay? Um, it just helps me. The Sorby tools are perhaps a little easier beading tool to use because they are a scraping tool. With those, you're actually starting with the tool like this, then going like this, then going like this. These, I think, work a little better in more difficult wood. Okay. Ready, cameraman? Okay. I'm bringing this around the corner a bit into the body of the bowl. Then I'm also bringing it over here into the top of the bowl. And to be honest, this headstock's kind of getting in my way. So I'm actually going to take the tool out of the holder for just a quick marking of where my second bead is going to go. We'll get to that when we, go, when we turn the thing around but this headstock kind of in the way a little bit, so that's all right. <laughs> I'm not just jabbing the tool into the wood. If you notice, I'm raising it up and down a little bit. I'm also doing a little bit of this just so I can get a little smoother cut with it. And that looks pretty good. Oh, question I always ask at this point in time is, you didn't sand the outside of it. It's all going to be gone anyway, okay? Uh, all the surface is going to be turned away. So that's one reason why I like doing these basket illusion pieces. It's really cut down on my sanding time. I'm not a big fan of sanding. Um, and we, yeah. Now we're going to use my eighth inch tool. The eighth inch is the one I use most of the time. Um, I did have, a couple of years ago at an art show, I had a lady looking at one of my pieces, and she goes, well, the, the beading gets bigger and goes smaller as it gets to the center of the platter. And it's like, no, it's all, used, all done using the same tool. She goes, no, it gets smaller. So what I did do, and I didn't bring it with me, I did kind of mess around a little bit using different size beads from, from the, the rim to the outside, so then people will go, Wow, those do get smaller. Um, so we're still working on that concept. Okay. Um, hmm. Normally when I'm doing this, I have a little more light on here, but this will work. I'm going to do the first pass. I have my handle down at about 45 degrees, and all I'm doing is lightly marking where my beads go. Now, I have had people look at my pieces and they go, oh, my God, those are so perfect. I mean, you, you just have those all, 
lined up and they're all the same size and all that. Okay, that's the tool, that's not me. I'm putting the left spur in the, in the groove I already have and then just rolling the right spur into the wood. So unless I do something majorly wrong, uh, it's pretty hard not to have it come out right. Um, that is why you only go in a little ways though because if I went and dug, cut the whole bead, then that bottom of that groove would be so far down, it's like, okay, where does this go exactly? Um, on a bowl this size, I'm just going to go ahead and bead the whole thing down to our stop line. We're pretty close. Okay. We'll quit. Oh, we'll do one more. What the heck? Okay. Okay. Any more questions? You guys are really quiet. Like I said, I taught high school kids. I'm not used to quiet. <laughs> okay. Now I'm raising my handle up a little more. It's probably more around 30 degrees. I'm probably doing a little bit instead of the up and down motion. I'm doing a little bit more of the wiggle motion like so. It does load up with your little shavings. That's why a little air hose would be handy. Um, no, I I pretty much am gonna start at the rim anyway. I don't care if at the bottom if I end up with a donut or if I end up with a button. That really doesn't matter to me anyway. Um, I have found out that. Um, through trial and, ex and experience, um, I, I almost prefer that the outside beads and the inside beads don't perfectly line up because I did one last year where they did perfectly line up and so when I was all done and had it reverse chucked and I was just doing the very inside, it's like, oops, that went way too deep and I ended up with a hole in the center but I ended up uh, weaving a little um, dream catcher and filled up the hole and I took it to a show down in Southern Colorado. Ooh, is that one for sale? Yeah. Okay, not anymore. So I go, okay, cool. Um, so, no, I, I really don't care um, how many there are or where they end up, whatever. I just start and go. <laughs> so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise my handle up higher. Um, it's more, now it's more of a negative rake scraper. So I've taken away the aggressiveness of it. Um, and I'm just smoothing it off. I'm also watching the, the beads to see them change color. I want them to be all the same color. You can't see it from where you're at, but the bead I'm getting ready to work on now, there's a little dark streak going down the very center of it. Okay, That is a flat spot because it's not, I'm not touching with the tool yet, so that surface hasn't been turned. So what I'm going to do is turn it until it's all the same color. And if that happens, then I know that it is round. Uh, there are some people who recommend when starting beating, what they'll do with this blank of wood is before they start beating, is they'll take a pencil and they will just draw pencil marks all over it because then when you get done when you get rid of the pencil lead you know you've gotten rid of all the wood I am cutting pretty close on the equator of this piece of wood that's what I'm trying for anyway I'm a little bit below the equator right now, I think, because I've gotten closer to... See, there goes that pencil lead. <sighs> and that's why there's really no reason to sand this piece of wood first, because I'm turning all the wood away anyway. Um, now, if there was a, heaven forbid, a tool mark or a, or a, a dig or whatever, um, 
or a little tear out, whatever, then I might hit it with some sandpaper, but in this case not. I'm going to leave that last bead because that's the one we're going to start on when we go the other way. Yes, Chris? Are those pretty friendly as far as trying to catch them so much? Are these pretty friendly? They are pretty friendly so long as you're paying attention. If you're not paying attention and you're looking like this and you go to, you know, get your cup, if you touch this edge against that spinning piece of wood, it will dig in and it will fly back at you. That's why the Sorbies are a little user friendly than these. But as far as using them, um, they're pretty friendly uh, because you're doing a shear cut. So you're really not putting that much pressure on them. Okay. Another question. Linda, you had your hand up? No, I was oh, okay. Anybody else? Now, I did, I did, uh, Carter always tells the story. He was, he was turning, what's my speed? Right now, we're at 11.11, okay? Uh, my lathe at home, my, my, I use a Vicmark uh, VL300. Uh, it does not have a speedometer on it or a tachometer on it. So I pretty much go by speed, and, or I go by sound and feel. Um, so could I go a little faster with this? Yeah, and I probably will on the inside. But it turned out pretty good, okay? Now, we're going we're gonna to darken the bottom of those grooves, and there's several ways we can do it. We could use a wire for like the first two or three or five maybe. But when we get down here, it's kind of hard to get a wire in there. And when we're doing the inside, it's impossible to get a wire in here. So what we're going to do is okay, for mica samples from the hardware store. Okay. You go into Home Depot or Lowe's, and it's like, oh, excuse me, do you have countertop material? Yes, we do. Could I see some samples, please? So then you go take 15 or 20 or 30, because they're not paying for them anyway. Now, the ironic part is, don't get the Formica. Formica is thicker. It doesn't work as well. Probably works better for countertops, but doesn't work as well for this. I use the Wilson Art. Okay. Now, I do know one guy who does beading, he's emailed me a couple times, he, he thinks they're still a little too thick, so what he does is he runs them through his thickness sander. <laughs> you know, if you want to, and what I have done, I have taken them to a disc sander and kind of feathered the edges, but it works. Okay. Um, I did have one guy uh, down at San Diego, he swears that the lighter colored ones work better than the dark colored ones. Okay, um, I like the lighter colored ones because if I drop them on the floor, they're easier to find. Um, okay, all we're going to do, I'm going to reverse this lathe, and I'm going to increase the speed a little bit. Okay, a lot of bit. And I'm going to... I have gotten emails from people who have seen my demos, and they'll email me, they go, how do you get that to burn? I can't get it to burn. What am I doing wrong? And to be honest, I don't know how to answer them because I have never not had them burn. I mean, all you have to do is get plenty of speed going and put some pressure in it. What is my speed now? We're like at 1350 is all we're at. Um, so it, it's not like we're going 2500. So 1350, 15 probably would be better. But I didn't look until I started to burn. And that's what I've used up on this one now. Yes, I bent off the corners. But what I do is I use my shears and I cut them so it's pointy again. Okay? Sharper points go into tight, smaller radiuses. Okay, we're done on the outside. Let's turn this thing around. Here is a nice improvement on the Powermatic. Is they did make the spindle lock lock in place all on its own so you don't have to hold it with your hand which I like. I'm not a huge Powermatic person but um, I do, they do make a good product. I like my Vicmark. Come on. Okay, now we're going to put it in a chuck. Set this aside. I don't think there's any reason to pass that around. It's just pretty much a center. 
Last week, um, for the El Camino Club, I had to turn on a one-way. Okay, One-ways are a good lathe, don't get me wrong, but um, the headstock is 33 millimeter uh, instead of an inch and a quarter. <laughs> the tailstock, the headstock is also a, a number two Morse taper. The tailstock is a number three Morse taper. Uh, so it's just kind of a, it's a Canadian thing, okay? Um, we've talked to the owners of, of uh, One Way before. Kurt Theobald is a, is a One Way guy. He's got a couple of One Ways. And we've talked to them about, you know, if you would change this, it would make it a little bit easier. They just look at you and they go, One Way, our way. And it's like, okay. Uh, we had just a little bit of wobble, so I just loosened it up and turned it. You know what? That's running pretty good. Okay. I know how wide I want this about there. So now we might as well start hollowing it out. And I'm going to use Glenn Lucas's method, uh, which is basically cutting across face grain as opposed to cutting into end grain, uh, which works pretty good. I am going to be a little gentle with this because it is a demo and I don't have that deep of a uh, recess in there and I don't want these fellows here to be catching it. So we are going to be a little gentle. Luckily I sharpened these gouges uh, before demo started. Now if I were smart, and I don't know if I was or not, I would have drilled that hole to the depth that I want this bowl to be when we're done. Okay. Now you notice when I'm cutting out that little uh, hemisphere, I'm starting with my gouge clear over here. That way my bevel can be aiming straight into the wood. As I'm cutting, I'm swinging the handle all the way around. Now right there, you can hear and feel it, that it's cutting different. That's because right now I'm cutting straight into end grain. Bring it up and do that in two or three cuts instead of trying to do it in one. Okay? Yes? Say what? Okay. Um, let me hollow this out and when we get ready to start, I will sharpen that eighth inch one. And we'll show you. I do it on the wheel and we will, yeah. So now what I'm going to do is, again, cut across face grain so I don't have to cut into end grain. All I'm doing is taking little 3 8 half inch wide cuts. Last week when I was doing the demo at El Camino uh, for that club, I did have, did have one guy in the second row kind of fell asleep on me. He was an older fellow, and he kind of you know, fell asleep on me. It kind of reminded me of a story Carter used to say. Carter used to demo with Dale Nish a bunch, and they were over in England one time, and Lee was sitting there, and Dale was up here demoing, and, and Dale noticed that uh, the guy next to him was, had fallen asleep and stuff, and he goes, Carter. He goes, wake that guy up. Carter looks at him and goes, you wake him up. You're the one who put him to sleep. So, What's that? The skating. the skating. I want to do that. Yeah, no. Uh, just make sure your just make sure your bevel is is perpendicular to the surface, and and put it in with authority. I was kind of talking and not really having a grip on it and stuff. So yeah, make sure it is perpendicular to the surface, so and that'll avoid a lot of that. Now here's something that Glenn Lucas told us too at that class. And I didn't really realize it, but it, and I, I do it sometimes and not sometimes. You know, your typical thing is 
is when you're doing a bowl now, you're getting kind of far away from the tool rest, so people want to turn their tool rest. Glenn says, no, don't turn your tool rest. Turn your whole banjo. That way the tool rest is still over the top of the banjo, and it's going to cut down on the vibration a lot and all that kind of stuff. Now, on this banjo, because we're off-centered anyway, it's not that big a deal, but, it, but if you're... Uh, tool rest post is over the center of the banjo, it's going to make a huge amount of difference in the amount of vibration and stuff like that. So turn the whole banjo, okay? Okay, let's get this finished up. And I'm just doing a little bevel rubbing, rubbing cut. That way I can control the depth of my gouge. If I have the gouge handle out like this, just using the tip, you're going to get wood removed, but you're going to end up with a really uneven surface. If you allow that bevel to rub the surface, You can avoid that. Probably be a good time to check the depth of my piece. I could do it several ways. I could use the calipers. I could use a couple other things. I'm just using the simplest tool available for me right now. It's just my pencil. I'm just sighting along the front edge and the back edge, marking on the pencil where the depth is. We're about there. I know that we're about there. So I still have a little bit I can go on the bottom. Okay. And I check in my surface. I do have a rough edge right there uh, that we need to get rid of. What I like doing is you can feel, you can see more with your fingers than you can with your eyes sometimes. So let's mark those so I know where I need to take wood away. Question. So you're putting slots on both ends of the bowl, so what's the consideration? <laughs> that is, that's a good question. The question is, I'm going to be putting beads on both sides of the bowl, so how does that determine or how does that factor into the thickness of the bowl? That's one reason why I like using the 1 8 inch beading tool. Uh, because then I can do a 3 8 thick piece or 5 16 and not worry about the beads meeting. Um, if you're, the bigger the beading tool you use, the more wood it's going to remove. And so the thicker you have to leave your platter or bowl or whatever. Um, when I first got into beading, I bought the whole Sorby set. It goes like 8 inch, 3 16 quarter, 3 8 and I don't know, like, five sixteenths or something. I've never used the three big ones on there because, I mean, you would have to literally, you know, turn something three-quarter inch thick to not go through. Um, I like the looks of the smaller beads anyway, but I also like that I can use a thinner piece of wood or end up with a thinner uh, piece. Yeah, good question. Okay. Uh, yes? Yes. You'd be cutting against the end grain, so you'd end up with a little more tear. Um, yeah. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to go from big to little on the inside now, so that I'm working with the grain and avoiding any tear. I am going to lower my tool rest down just a little, so that I can drop the handle of my gouge a little bit and get a little bit more of a shear cut. Yeah? How much do you need to worry about the uh, final surface here, since you're going to be needing it after? So long as it's smooth, I don't care if it's 80 grit smooth or, or 240 grit smooth, so long as there's no humps and bumps in it. And what we'll do is I'll come in with a um, uh, negative rake scraper and just touch it up in case we have to. Yeah, um, yeah, good question. Alan, do you have something? Any comments? Okay. Yeah. 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 
And on, um, on this piece, I, I hollowed out the whole inside. If I'm doing a bigger platter, like a 16, 18 inch one, I'll do it about two inches at a time or two and a half inches at a time on the inside because I've already turned the outside, so I'll take the inside to the thickness I want, bead that part, leave the mass of wood in the center, go down another two and a half inches, whatever, uh, bead that part, and then finish up on the very bottom. Uh, here, uh, because we're only about seven inches, it's not that big, big a deal. We are going to get a little chattering and all that as we start beating, but not near as bad as if it was a bigger piece. The higher the pitch of the squeal, the thinner you're getting it. When you don't hear any squeal at all, uh, you're probably through. <laughs> so you don't want that. Okay. We're, we're going to quit there. I've got some rings in there that are obvious uh, to me, probably obvious to the camera. Uh, but what I'm going to do is we're going to quit there and come in with another tool. Could I get those out with a gouge? Of I certainly could give it a try, but it's a little easier. We're just going to come in with negative rake. What? Negative rake scraper. Okay? My negative rake, I've used several of them. I've made several. Uh, taking an old bowl scraper and then grinding the top bevel on it as well and shed a lot of tears going, God, I'm just ruining a good tool. Uh, if I were to do it again, I would do what I did here and just buy one. They're already ready made. Uh, you can take them out of the box and, and do it. This is one that Kurt Theobald sells, one of our past members. Uh, this is actually a Thompson tool. Uh, it's a 10V, uh, it's pretty hard stuff. I'm not wild about the shape of this one. Uh, the one I had before was more of an asymmetrical curve. I like it better, and I will be grinding this one, taking some off of this corner to make it more of a slope so it follows the um, curve of the bowl better. But when you're using a negative scraper, you always need to have the handle pointing downhill a little bit towards the bowl. You don't ever want to use it like this. So. I'm good. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, and we really don't have any tear out. If you're not sure if the bottom is flat or not, get something that is flat and put it on here and see if you have daylight. Yeah, we go down an eighth of an inch from the corners of the tools, so that's good enough. Okay? Okay, question was earlier, how do you sharpen beating tools? Um, might as well sharpen them both while we're here. Even though I've only cut one bead with this, we'll still do it. I'm using CBN wheels. Uh, this is a 360 grit or 50 grit, whatever they are, on this side. Um, I use that primarily on my beading tools. And I have that at, um, I have my platform set at 55 degrees. Uh, one of the first demos I did, somebody asked me, well, what angle is that supposed to be? And to be honest, I didn't know. I just matched it visually. Uh, and so what I did was I went and bought a couple more beading tools so I could measure the angle on them, and I bought two of them, and of course they were at two different angles. So, so I kind of split the difference and came up with 55 degrees. Okay, now, the 55, the, the rest I'm using is Stuart Batty's tool rest. I think they're the best on the market, because no matter what angle you set this is, it maintains the same gap between the wheel and the rest. Most of the rest, the ones that come with, with the, um, one-way system, 
no matter how you adjust that, you either have to move it in or out to keep uh, to not hit the wheel. I like these. They are expensive, but I do like them because they, they always keep that same distance. And what I do with mine, typically when I get at home, I have a couple of one-inch washers that I put right in between there, or you make your, your slide the right distance out so that it is always at that same dimension. Um, here's a couple Here's a couple things we're talking earlier about um, club members um, and what they can do. Dave Landers, I don't know, a year or so ago, he showed me a couple things that he does for sharpening, which worked pretty good. And, you know, to set up a one-way system, Wolverine system, he came up with this. And I don't know if he came up with it or if he copied it somewhere, but it works. Okay, he called it his pistol. And what you do is you put it in here, and guess what? That's the angle that I want the leg of my... Wolverine to be for a uh, Glenn Lucas style gouge, okay? So I know I have that. He also came up, I used the um, Stuart, Stuart Batty system to set my angles or to check my angles. Well, I'm trying to check an angle off of only a quarter inch surface, and sometimes that's kind of hard to tell, you know, whether you have it accurate or not. So Dave also came up with some of these things that this one happens to be for 55 degrees, okay? So they're just made out of plywood and all that. It was one time in a meeting, he goes, here, if you want to copy, if you want to trace these on a piece of paper and go home and make them, go ahead. I don't care. This one is for setting up the slide on here for the proper grind on a gouge. Slide this in when this comes up against here. That's how far this needs to come out, okay? You can also buy things. Um, I've had people talk about the Raptor system before, and so what I ended up doing, I ended up breaking down and buying a couple of the Raptor tools. Well, the problem is Raptor doesn't make a 55-degree gauge. They make a 50 and a 60. So what I did is I bought the 60, and I ground it shorter here, and ground off a little bit here and a little bit here, so now it fits when I'm doing my gouges to get a 55 degree angle on the nose of my gouge. So, I mean, any of these things um, can be done. Question? Where did you get that angle rust? Where did you start the... This, this rest? Yes. The only place these are available is uh, through a place called Woodworkers Emporium out of Las Vegas, Christian Breeze Pierre. Um, they're good. I mean, they're expensive, but they're good. I think this rest is about $125 um, or $115, something like that. Plus the adapter is like another $35 or something like that. So it's pretty much about $150 the way you're looking at it now. Um, well, yeah. And, and, you know, keeping that distance between the wheel and the, and the tool rest is really critical. Um, you know, we can pass that around if you want. I, I'm probably done with it for now. But it's a good system. One thing I did on mine, when you buy them, if you buy them, these nuts here are square. And depending on your grinder, uh, you can't tighten them or loosen them because they're up against a grinder. So all I did was mount them in my lathe and rounded them off. So now I can turn them when they're in the grinder. Um, Stuart, love him or hate him, this is one of his great ideas, and it's a good one. Um, yeah, I stopped and saw Christian as I was going through uh, Vegas the other day, and I bought a couple bowl blanks. He goes, what, you don't have wood in Colorado? I go, I go well, not pre-dried cherry wood, no. So I got a couple of those. Okay, so that's all I do for sharpening is I just true it up a little bit. I'm not trying to remove material, I'm just trying to make sure my points are fresh. Okay, so, we'll turn that down a little bit. We got a little bit of wobble because we rechucked it. 
Not enough that it's going to matter. Now, I'm getting a little bit of vibration on this. If, if I was using a bigger, if I was turning a bigger platter, I do have the one-way bowl steady even though I don't use it very often. Whoops, that's not good. Okay, we'll fix it. That's one of those things Clarence was talking about, a new design opportunity. So what I use is a little more primitive system, but still works. It's called a glove, okay? I'm thinking about marketing these, um, and I'd sell them in pairs, okay? And all I'm going to do, I'm going to turn my speed up a little. I'm just going to hold it. And you can hear how much difference it made. Okay, I think we're about done. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, looks pretty good. Okay, so now we're going to finish beating with the smaller tool uh, right on down the line. I did move the headstock this way so I can stand right here at the end of the lathe. Otherwise, I'd be leaning over the lathe. makes it a little harder to do. If you have a sliding headstock, please take advantage of it. Again, I'm starting off by marking off all my beads. And on a piece this small, I am going to go all the way to the center. I am trying to hold the tool perpendicular to the surface that is being beaded. Once I get down at the bottom, I really don't have that vibration anymore because it's all supported by the chuck. And let's say, yeah, we can do one more. Clean that off. Normally, I would have a little better lighting. I'd have a couple LED lights shining down on here. I do not want to come at the middle and back to the outside. If I do that, I'm making my beads deeper, which is weakening the wood, so I'm going to get vibration. So I'm going to have to start the rim again. Here's where the compressed air comes in handy. We used to have an air hose that used to run here, but uh, it's gone. I have used bendy straws. And I tend to use these in my small hollowing or hollow form classes, like Christmas ornaments and stuff. There are two rules to using a, a bendy straw when you're turning. Rule number one is blow, don't suck. And number two is put the long end in your mouth and the short end in the turning. I will have students who will do it like this, and then they wonder why their eyes are getting full of wood chips. Okay? So you have to follow the rule if you're going to be in my class. Okay? Okay, so we're going to come back to the outside. I'm going to raise my tool rest up a little bit now that we have these marked off. Mine your way.
Again, I'm trying to make them all the same color. So if they're the same color, I know they're all turned. And I am going to come back and do one more light pass. Get rid of the glove. You can see the difference, I think, in the camera between the pretty round ones and the pretty flat ones, okay? They're all pretty. I just need to make them round. <laughs> we were coming home on Tuesday, and in one gift shop, there's, a, you know, those signs that you can buy. I almost bought a sign. It said, between you and I, we're pretty unusual. I'm pretty and you're unusual. Okay, we're gonna blow that off one more time. Yeah, this was a great idea from one of my students and it works. Works quite well. Otherwise, the shavings always, or the dust always builds up in your biggest diameter, centrifugal force, whatever. And you try and get in there with the beating tool and you can't even see where in the heck you're going. So normally what I would do is be to just touch this up one last time on the grinder. My, my rest is going away um, and I don't think I really need to. Um, I am gonna raise my tool rest just a shade. About there. And let's come in and we're gonna finish this thing up. I've got my tool handle pretty horizontal, so I'm trying to take away, I'm not really trying to remove a lot of wood, I'm just trying to smooth things out. Okay, we're going to say that's done. Let's blow that off so the camera can see it good when I turn it off. Pardon? Oh, okay. 8.02 is what my time guy is telling me. So, what we need to do now is burn those lines, or burn the valleys. And I'm going to use the tool rest to help me st stabilize. I didn't reverse it this time, because this way I can use the tool rest to help, help me support the piece of countertop. Otherwise, I'm using my finger to do it. Sometimes that gets hot. Okay. Cool. Now it's time to draw lines. Okay. I'm not a very good artist. I can't draw a stick man and have it be identifiable. Uh, but I can draw straight lines and I can color inside the lines. So that's the important part for me. Okay. At this stage, we're going to add some new equipment. We're going to get rid of that. And we are going to um, add a tool rest. Now, this tool rest started off much simpler than this at one time. Just started as a block of wood on a one inch dowel. And then the dowel started getting chewed up from the, from the, screw and I couldn't always get inside so 
Now I've made my block a little curved. I went with a piece of one inch aluminum. I've also um, got a couple different of these plywood ones. So now I can draw lines on both sides of the bowls at the same time. Okay. We're going to put our index plate on. This is a product that I do make um, and sell. Um, and just to bring my chuck a little further away from it, I'm just going to put an adapter on. This is basically a one, in, one and a quarter to one inch adapter. Uh, followed by a one to one and a quarter adapter. Because what that does is gives me room to put my index pointer in here. Okay. This start off, again, much simpler. Started off looking like this, uh, which is kind of primitive but it did work. This is an old screwdriver that I ground the point on. Um, so I wanted to improve it. I ended up going with something like this out of some double T-track and all that kind of stuff, uh, except to make this and try and sell it would be cost prohibitive, even though my little pointer thing, I did, I did beat it just to make it look pretty. Um, but I ended up with I ended up with this system here, and the way this works is this fits on the bed of the lathe like so. And it will fit on this system. This is a 15 inch disc, so it'll fit on any lathe, um, 16 inch and, or 15 inch and smaller. 72 inch. I know this particular bowl, this size is about seven inches in diameter. And so all I'm going to do is set up my pointer system. Now, in my original pointer system, you had to keep pulling the pin out and all that kind of stuff, and it got to be kind of a bit of a pain. Uh, my new system, uh, or what I've revised it to do, is I don't really pull the pin at all. I just pull the disc and go from hole to hole to hole. Uh, this disc is made out of 3 16 ABS. Um, it allows it to flex. Get in here, get my little guide up here, and get my pencil. I have an electric pencil sharpener right here in my shop so I can keep my pencil sharp. Uh, what I'm going to do today is just make sure that I have a couple of pencils that will hopefully stay sharp. Okay, now to figure out how many divisions to make this, um, we need to know the diameter. And the diameter of this piece is about six and three quarter. Okay, if I take 6.75 times pi, which is 3.1416, um, I end up with 21.2 inches. Okay. Now I know because I've done this a few times um, that if I divide it by 72, I end up with segments that are 0.29 inches long at the top. Okay. To me, that looks pretty good. Now, if I were to do it. Um, 96 segments or 96 divisions, then they're only 0.22, so they're less than a quarter inch. They're pretty small, okay? And if I were to do it 60, they'd end up like 0.35. So I've found out over time using this that basically 10 times your diameter, find that number on the wheel, and it works pretty good. So if it's a seven inch bowl, 72 works pretty good. If it's a 10 inch bowl, then 96 works pretty good. If it's 12 inch bowl, 120 works pretty good, whatever. Oh, I thought I had this set. Um, we're gonna set it so our pencil is at the midpoint. Were you a math teacher? I was industrial tech and I did teach um, all the drafting and AutoCAD classes. Um, 
So I, I'm, I'm a bit of a number nerd. Uh, that doesn't make me a bad person, okay? <laughs> okay. Now, I've gotten to the point where I can draw 72 lines, front side and back side, in about three and a half minutes, okay? So long as no one is bothering me and all that kind of stuff. Um, people go, oh my God, your lines are so straight and all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, but it's practice, okay? Okay. Um, but you can't balance a pencil on a tool rest. Okay, that's why you have to come up with a flat platform. When I just had that block of wood and the one inch dowel, I did have people, oh, could you make me one and sell me one? It's like, no, I think you can probably uh, drill a one inch hole in a piece of wood um, and make it fit on your tool rest. Okay. Um, yeah, this is sort of the part of the demo where it's like watching a hollow form turn or turn. Um. <laughs> you only use every index pedal? Say what? I, it it kind of depends. Like sometimes if I'm doing like a real small thing and, uh, you know, I don't want to use them all. Uh, like, for example, if I were turning on a, on a uh, Laguna lathe, like one of my tool handles that is beaded um, 24 times, uh, or divided 24 times, I wouldn't use uh, the, the index on a Laguna lathe because the Laguna lathes are indexed at 14, 36, and 48. It'd just be too confusing. So I'd probably go to the 48 on this and do every other hole. Um, I do make a smaller one to fit on MIDI lathes uh, that doesn't have quite as many divisions to it, and it works pretty good as well. Um, it's designed to fit on 10-inch lathes and... and uh, bigger. Uh, this one is designed to fit on 15 inch lays and bigger. So of course last year at our symposium I was one of the demonstrators and I was demonstrating Basket Illusion and so Alan puts me in the room that um, Michael Roper provided the lathe for uh, which was a Harvey lathe with a 14 inch swing. It's like that ain't gonna work. But we made it work. I used one of my smaller indexes so it worked. Um, Uh, well, I have, I have a, my index plate at home, um, I have one, this is the one I use 90% of the time, but I do have one that's a little bigger, it's 20 inches in diameter, and it goes up to 288 divisions, uh, which I did once on a, uh, like a 22 inch platter, uh, but it also took me about 12 hours to burn all those lines, I think or maybe more than that, maybe like 20 hours, so it's like, oh my God. So, um, yeah, so it all kind of depends on the piece. Now, I did have in San Diego class, I did have a couple of my students that were using the 3 16th beading tool. Well, guess what, with the 3 16th beading tool, uh, the beads can be a little bit longer, the divisions can be a little longer, so they were doing bowls about this size and they used the 60 inch. And on bigger beads, the, or the 60 divisions, and the 60 looked pretty good. Um, okay. Now, we're getting ready. Whoop. We're getting ready to do um, some burning on this. When, I, when I'm burning, I happen to use a razor tip burner. Uh, there's several others out there that are good burners. Um, I've had razor tip for probably 10 years or seven years or something, I, I like it. Uh, there are other ones out there. We do happen to sell it here at Woodcraft. Um, I don't know, yeah, I think I bought my second one here. Uh, Craft Supplies also and Treeline sell it. Um, I do not buy my pens here, uh, typically, because we only sell the regular duty and I like the heavy duty, so I do get those from Treeline. Um, so now we're done here, okay? So now what we need to do is we need to burn all those lines. It's like, oh my God. Not a bad thing though. Gotta really rub that for my time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so when I'm burning, typically I'm doing it in my living room. 
sitting next to my wife. She's on the couch. I'm on, I'm on my recliner. I have an LED light shining over my left shoulder here, and I'm burning. Now, when I'm burning the lines, I'm using particular pens, okay? Typically, my pen of choice is this one. Oh, good. Lid came off. It wants to come out and play. Okay. And I'll pass one of these around. This is kind of my pen of choice. It is a medium spear tip, heavy duty. I like it because you can use both sides of it. So uh, you, can, you can either burn with both hands if you want or you can use both edges of it. Once in a while, I will use this burner here, which is a skew tip. Now the reason I use these as opposed to using the tips that burn over the top of the bead, like this one, is number one, I've never found those to be accurate enough or my beads accurate enough that I can do it. And second of all, with these longer blades, it's once you get the line started, it just tracks on line and it makes a straight cut. With that one, you have to do each and every bead, okay? Now, that bigger platter, and I didn't really bring any big platters, but those platters there have about, this one has 11,780 little rectangles. Um, this one, 11,880. I really don't want to burn 11,880 lines. I would much rather burn two times 120, 240 lines. Uh, I can keep them straighter, I can keep them more accurate, and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, people did ask, they go, why don't you burn the lines while it's on the lathe? You know, use your rest and burn the line. I've seen it done last year at AEW. They were demonstrating how to do it and all that kind of stuff. Well, the problem is, two problems. Number one, they had the burner cranked up so high that it was just really scorching the wood, and they didn't sand it afterwards, so it looked kind of not real good. And second of all, uh, burning of the lines is what takes the time, okay? Um, probably a half of the time involved in any of those pieces is burning the lines. I really don't want to stand on a concrete floor for six or eight hours burning lines when I can sit on my recliner and have the TV on, have my wife sitting over on the couch and having maybe a cold beverage, sitting next to me and all that kind of stuff and being able to burn, okay? Now, when I'm burning, I don't burn every line because if I did, it would seem like it would take forever to get around a platter, especially if it's a big platter that has like 144 divisions. Um, I don't want to sit here and burn every one of those. It'll take 10 hours to get around the thing. So what I do when I'm burning, typically I burn uh, the inside or outside, doesn't matter. We'll, we'll start on the outside because it's easier to photograph is I burn one line and I'm just letting that edge of that blade keep myself straight. I skip three and I burn the fourth one. I skip three and I burn the next one. That way it only takes me a fourth as long to get all the way around the piece. Okay. I, I have been accused of, of having perhaps a little OCD, but I also tell people I'm also a little ADHD, so I only have to be perfect for a little while. So, <laughs> but this way, I get around it um, in a fourth of the time, and it doesn't seem quite so laborious to me. Then what I do is I come back, second trip around, I'll do the line in the middle. Okay, and then the next one in the middle. And then the last time around, typically, I'm going to do this line here, and then I'm going to skip three. One, two, three. Come on, don't laugh. You're hurting my feelings now. <laughs> and again, that way it doesn't take me too long to get all the way around the thing. Okay? Now, 
you didn't notice any huge smoke going up in the sky. That's because I don't want to burn my wood. I'm just trying to put that line in there. The, more you, the higher heat you put on it, the more you're going to scorch it, the more you're going to have to sand off later. Okay? So, now we are to this. Okay, there it is. Now we're to this stage. No, we're not. I had one of these done already. Here it is. Okay, so we got our lines burned, and now we need to turn off the bottom. Okay, that's what I was talking about during, during the critique, is making it look prettier. Could I leave it like this? Yes. Are there people who do? Yes. Um, I like to have my bowls beaded all the way to the bottom. I think they look better. I think they look more realistic. Uh, most of the baskets I'm familiar with were beaded clear to the bottom. There are several um, basket illusion guys who leave the bottom flat wood, and that's fine for them, not for me, okay? So, we got this, we need to fix this up, okay? We're still pretty rough here because of uh, the burning. Um, actually, this one I just started burning. You can feel, pass that around if you would, Jim. You can feel how rough that is uh, just for the few lines that I have on there, okay? You can feel that surface. So what we need to do, is we're going to take our disc off. Oh, no. Did it break yet? Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, it'll work. I'm not that fussy. Okay. Now we're going to sand. Okay? And this is literally the extent of my sanding. Um, like I said, I don't really particularly like sanding much. Um, so I try and cut it as well as I can, and then not sand unless I have to. Here's my sandpaper. My sanding, I'm going to start at 240 grit and go up to 1500. Not that I need to, but I do, okay? Um, years ago, when unfortunately David Nimmin passed away and we were cleaning out his shop and garage, um, there's a great big box about this big, full of sandpaper, just full. And uh, Cindy goes to me, Cindy Drozda goes to me, she goes, Doug, why don't you just take that box of sandpaper? And it's like, there's brand new sheets in there. I said, there's a lot of sandpaper in there. I said, don't you want to keep it? And Cindy told me with a straight face, she goes, I never need to sand blow 400 grit. <laughs> I go, okay, I do. So I took it. Okay, we're gonna slow our lathe down. This is literally the extent of my sanding on here, okay? We got our lathe running, you know, it's like 700 RPM. I'm gonna take my 240, 320. The sandpaper I'm using happens to be Festool. Um, we do sell it here, but that's neither here nor there. The reason I like it is it's 50 cents a square. Um, so I did three grits in backwards. I'm going to do three grits forward. Yeah, these are like 50 cents a square, which to me is a pretty good deal. Sorry. And now we're going to just hit it with the really fine stuff. I don't want to do too much sanding or too coarse a grit, because I really don't want to take off a lot of wood. I'm just trying to take those burrs off uh, from the wood burner, which I've done. Okay. So now what we'll do is 
we're going to reverse turn this, reverse chuck it into a into jumbo jaws. Tonight we're going to use the small set because they're already set for the diameter we need. Um, this is my one and only Nova Chuck uh, with a set of Nova jaws on it. Anybody in here have the Nova Cole jaws? Okay, a few of you. Do yourself a favor. Throw away the buttons that come with it. The buttons that come with it are soft rubber. They have no insert in them. As you tighten up the screw, they actually bulge out in the center. They do not hold a piece of wood on the lathe unless you have a tailstock against it, unless you're very lucky. These happen to be the one-way uh, replaceable buttons. You can get them at, at uh, craft supplies, whatever. Uh, they're actually tapered, and they have a hard, hard steel insert in them, so they don't bulge out, and they work, okay? Uh, my other set of jumbo jaws is this one here, um, and I like these as well. They're tapered as well. They have a convex curve on two of the sides, convex on the other, and they work great as well. That is on my Vic Mark. I can do up to about 19 inch bowls on that. Um, now, one thing about these chucks, it does say on here somewhere, um, maximum speed 600 RPM, and I know I shouldn't say this, but I will. Um, if you get it going fast enough, you really can't read that. So, <laughs> so you can go a little faster, which you need to do for doing some of this job. Okay, yeah, 600 RPM just really quite, isn't quite fast enough. If I were using the original buttons on this, 600 would be way too fast, uh, but with these buttons on, I'm very confident that this piece is gonna stay on. We need to round this over, okay? Make it look better. Make sure I'm in reverse, or in forward. Nope. There we go. We need to take this edge down. We got a little bit of wobble, so let's um, turn my piece just a little, find a better spot for it. We'll try that. All I've done here, this is the original key that went with this chuck, but the problem is, by the, with the T-handle in it, you can't turn it because it hits the back of the chuck. You can only turn about an eighth of a turn. I just um, got a little ratchet and a half inch socket and ground the end of that at roughly a hexagonal type of shape. There we go, and it works just fine, okay? Uh, okay, this will work. You can use any tool, whatever you're comfortable with. Me, I'm a bull gauge guy. I have about seven or eight bowl gouges. That is my number one tool of choice. It doesn't matter whether this is a concave cut, a convex cut. Um, it really doesn't matter. All we're trying to do is get down to that surface. Typically, I use the curve of the gouge to make that transition. And if we have to cut into a couple existing beads, so be it. There we go. That looks pretty good. Okay, I think we're thick enough. I didn't really check. Here's our first one.
Okay, I'm getting a little chatter, so I'm going to raise my tool up a little bit so I can come in with that straight handle and get a good cut. I'm going to increase my speed a little bit. What's that? It almost looked like you had some chair up there also. That's why I didn't want to shut the lathe off, but yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit of tear out. We're going to get rid of it now, though. Good eye. Man, come on, camera guy. How we look now? That look better? Yep. Yeah, it does. Cool. Bless you. Huh. Okay. So now what we would do is we would draw those lines in the bottom. I don't use the index plate for that. What I end up doing is just using my pencil rest, turning it so it's going to fit, and I will just, pencil a little dull, I'm just going to line up the start of these lines and draw them to the center. And it's amazing how quick your body will learn where five degrees or whatever it is is each turn to make that happen, okay? Okay, so once I get that done, then we're looking at a bowl that looks like this, that now we have burned those new lines. Now, I don't always put the lines to the center. Sometimes I'll do a tangent uh, where they'll, they'll go off center. Your eye, when you're burning them, it's actually easier to go to the center of a piece than it is to not. Um, so I prefer going to the center. Okay, so what I would do in this case is we'd put her in the so, chuck. Uh, you know, I, I could, but the problem is it would only do about three bands, and I'd end up going with my other stuff anyway. And so just to save time, I just start and finish with, um, with, the, with the linoleum, or the countertop stuff. Electric wire? Uh, I'll leave that for guys like Dave Landers and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, and the way I'm doing it, I am not unique, or you know, I, the way I'm showing you is not the only way to do this. There are other techniques. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, whatever works for you, I, I just don't want to get involved with any more electricity than I have to. And, um, we did have, if you read the latest AEW magazine, there were like three more people that unfortunately got on the short end of Lichtenberg burning, and it's, uh, it's a little scary. Boom, and boom, okay. So, now I have it all sanded. Now we're pretty, now we're ready to start coloring. There's a little water comes out of these things I am finding, um, which I'm not sure I'm excited about. Okay, and again, now when I'm coloring, um, typically I do use grid paper. Oh, we got plenty of time, almost. 
Not plenty, but we got a little time. I do use circular grid paper. Now, from what I understand, you can, the way I got these is I used to teach AutoCAD, and uh, they shut down the drafting lab after I retired, uh, but one of the other schools still has theirs going, and I still know that teacher, so I talk to him every so often and say, hey, can I come in, use AutoCAD, and come up with some, some grids and stuff? He goes, I don't care. So I do. I understand there is a software program uh, that if you type in Polar Grid, it will come up with um, being able to make your own, uh, print them off. The problem being is they're only going to be 8.5 by 11 size. Uh, you can make them however many divisions you want. You can make them whatever. Um, I, I, I just like, you know, here's one here that one of my students down in San Diego came up with, with the swirls, with the diamonds in, inside the swirls. You know, some of these are good, some of them are bad. This one here is one my wife, I came home from work one day here at Woodcraft, and she, she hands me this and said, here, do this design. I go, you realize there's like 20 different colors in that design. She goes, you have 20 different colors. I know you do. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, probably. Um, so, you know, whatever, you know. You just come up with things and you play around and you see, you know, what it looks like, you know, and how you like it and all that kind of stuff. When I am coloring, here's my color bag. Actually, one of them. I go into, I go into Hobby Lobby now and uh, I have my color wheel with me and they go, oh my God, you have more colors than we do. I go, yeah, almost. Okay, here's some of my colors. Uh, I started off using what are called Copic markers, which are these ones here. And they're a brush tip marker, okay? Soft brush tip marker, okay? So you can get down in the cracks. I then later on started using Prismacolor. And again, oh, this is the wrong one. Um, again, using a brush tip marker. I've used a couple others. I've used a brand called um, Windsor Newton that I like. They're all alcohol-based ink pens, okay? Then I found these, which are Faber-Castell's version, and these are in India ink. I like them better. The ink sets up faster. It doesn't smudge. It doesn't smear. The bad news is, before I started, before I headed off to California, I stopped in my favorite art supply store and said, yeah, what, where, what happened to all the favorite Castell pens, you know, and all that? I need some. They go, oh, yeah, they're not making those anymore. Uh, they, they've, they've gone to the little ones because they can sell these for about the same money and you're going to have to buy more of them. So... So I'm not real excited uh, that they're kind of shorting me on my, on my pen supply. Um, so I'm looking at other sources. I did find in, in San Diego there's a pen or there's an art store called Dick's Blick or something like that. Um, here, here's, one of the, here's one of the Prisma colors with the, um, with the point on it. So they told me to check those guys out, which I probably will do. Um, check those out. And then, you know, there, get it. And here's some more. And uh, I started off getting pens, getting the, um, the pens because I was at Craft Supplies when they still had the Super Wednesday sale. And in the back room or in the, in the clearance shed, they had a little plastic box with like 15 or 20 of them in there for like five bucks. It's like, man, that's a good deal. Well, yeah, but that was only for 15 or 20. I now have four of those boxes that hold 36 pens a piece, and that's just that is just the Copics. And then I have you know 100 of these and 100 of these, so I have a lot of pens. I used to be really concerned and really serious about checking my color wheel and going, okay, now if I'm doing, if my main color is blue-green, then the split complementary would be with orange and with red, and the triadic 
complimentary would be red, violet, and yellow, orange. Well, finally, my wife one day, when I was trying to figure this out, she goes, really? You're making basket illusion pieces. You really think they got out their little color wheel and said, okay, what goes good with blue, violet? No, you find colors that you think look good together. So I've kind of tried to wean myself off of that a little bit. Not, not totally successful, but, but I'm working on it, okay? So when I am coloring, again, I'm sitting in my recliner, and I've got the light over my shoulder. I have found out now ooh, that I like to color the inside first, even though it's harder to do because you're going around an inside curve. But if you color the inside first, when you're coloring the outside, you're grabbing it by the rim and you're not smearing your colors. Whereas I used to do the outside first because it's easier and I can see how it developed. But then when I went to do the inside, then sometimes my, my fingers would be green. It's like, why is that? Um, so when you're coloring, and I'm not sure what design we're going to do on this. doesn't really matter. We're just going to do something. The thing to remember is you have to color both sides of the square. Now, um, a, a year or two ago, we had Malcolm Tibbetts here as a demonstrator, and Malcolm had a couple of his pieces with him. And I don't know if any of you remember, Malcolm had one piece that was kind of a big flat piece hung on the wall, and it kind of looked like corrugated metal. And when you looked at it dead on, the color of woods that stood out spelled out like piece or something like that. And if you stood to the right of it and looked at it, and it might have been on the slideshow that he did during the class, I can't remember. But if you were to the right of it and looked at it, the woods that stood out spelled like hope. And then from the left side said like love. I've been trying to figure out how I can color the different sides of the beads, the top side and the bottom side, different colors. So depending on how you're holding it, it looks different. That's kind of what I'm thinking about doing next. So what I do is I, I typically color, you know, down with one color. And then you do have to turn it around. I'm almost to the bottom. Now people always ask, no one's asked yet tonight, what happens if you screw up? Okay, depends how bad you screw up. If you only screw up like one or two squares, you can take either a little bit of sandpaper or you can take uh, an X-Acto knife and you can scrape off the color off of the square that shouldn't have been colored. I have had one case where I was doing a big platter, it was about an 18 inch platter, and I started coloring and I got about 90% of the way around and it's like this just does not look right, you know, and all that. Uh, somehow I had gotten off one square two different times, so I was two squares off and it was not going to end up right at the end, and there was really no way I can fix it. I ended up putting it back on the jumbo jaws, turned a little, t turned a little recess, a little grip on it, and put it back on the lathe and returned. I turned about an eighth of an inch off. Luckily it was thick enough I could do that and turned about an eighth of an inch off and started all over again. Um, that's really the only time I've had to do that drastic of a redo. Now, when you're doing these colorings or these patterns on the grid paper, um, you start thinking in, okay, on 72, what am I looking at? I'm looking at either one pattern of 72, two at 36, three at 24, you know, four at 18, um, six at 12, eight at nine, nine at eight. You start thinking in groups of how is this going to work out and play around so that it comes out even. I've tried doing random before where I just start color. I can't do that. Okay, it's not in my mindset. It's not in my personality. I can't just do that. It has to be orderly, it has to be symmetrical, it has to make sense. Now, any of you want to do this and just do it randomly, more power to you. Now, um, 
for people who think that, oh, I can't do that and all that, it takes too long and all this kind of stuff, to me, the coloring part is the relaxing part because I'm able to sit, I'm able to start seeing it come to fruition, I'm starting to see a finished product. And for me, that's kind of the satisfying part. But what I tell people, and, and next week when I'm down in Albuquerque, we're going to have one class where instead of doing a whole bowl, we're just going to do like five beads around the bowl as a band, an accent band, and color those in, or you know, color it some pattern. And then we're going to do tool handles so that they're starting off small. You know, um, some of the platters that are over here on the table, um, not so much this month, but a lot of times we have platters that have, you know, an inch and a half rim around. Bead that rim. You know, that's how Clarence started off. Uh, just doing it bits by bit by bit. You know, don't try and take on the whole thing, but do it a little bit at a time and until and you start getting used to it and all that kind of stuff. So, how are we doing on time? Good question. Yes. Um, not as well as you wish it would. Um, so what I have, and it's here somewhere, um, I have a disc of, um, maybe it is in there. I have a disc of maple that I have all of my Copic colors uh, colored in on. And, oh, here we go. See, here, oh, wait, no, that's not it. This is it. Um, but I, I, walk into, I walk into Hobby Lobby, and they go, oh, my God, you have that many colors? I go, well, those are just the Copic markers. Those aren't the Prismacolors and the Faber-Castells. They go, oh, my God. But um, it is good to have them on a piece of wood, the wood that you're going to be coloring, because sometimes it does make a big difference. Yeah. Um, on a piece I didn't bring tonight, there was uh, the color wheel. I, I was coloring it. And one of the yellows that I used looked good on paper, but when I put it on wood, it really turned brownish tan instead of yellowish tan. And it's like, ugh. But, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, any other questions? Yes. Oh, I do. I spray them. Um, typically, if I'm using the, especially if I'm using the Faber-Castell, I spray them with um, lacquer, uh, clear lacquer, rattle can lacquer, uh, or I'll use Artist Fixative. Uh, either, typically, I, I stay with satin, uh, sometimes matte. Once in a while, I'll do a semi-gloss, but most times satin and most of the time, either uh, lacquer or acrylic. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. yes. I want to clear the air on one thing. I was very fortunate in having this gentleman in my class almost 40 years ago. We've been good friends ever since. And uh, I hope everybody gives this a try. However, he knows my feeling on this here. I think somebody did it. So things like this, we got too much time. <laughs> <laughs> short interest from the beginning. And so, uh, but I'm very, very proud of him. And, uh, he's uh, getting the uh, uh, well-known uh, wood turner. And uh, you ever got, what issue was it in? You ever got four pages or five pages in the wood turning? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, June of 17, I was, uh, the British Wood Turning Magazine did an article on me, uh, which I do have here somewhere. And uh, then the American Wood Turner did just kind of a picture spread of some of my stuff. So, um, anyway, I don't know what you think that I taught him anything here. He's got all that on his own. <laughs> <laughs> He's way above me. He, can, he couldn't even carry my own. I mean, his life. You ought to be in the first class. I thought the next time he's going to be a wood turner. <laughs> <laughs> You bet. I yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I've had some good mentors all along the way. Uh, that's all I can say is, you know, I certainly didn't get here on my own. Um, 
people challenging me, people helping me, people, you know, whatever. Um, take advantage of it. Woodturners as a whole are going to be a very, very helpful group of people. Um, anytime you have questions, they're going to try and answer them. So um, that's going to be it. I do have some of the index wheels. Uh, if you're interested in, in, you know, taking one of those home with you, I do have some of those. Um, and if you want to come talk, fine. I work here, so they're not going to be quite as upset if I don't get out of here by 9 o'clock. I have a key to the place, by God. So, um, <laughs> But I want to thank you all. You're a very good crowd. <laughs>